Welcome to another episode of the Animal Liberation Hour, where we seek insight from animal rights and liberation activists around the world so that we can think, reflect, learn, and be inspired. It's season three, and we have a lot more guests for you to be inspired by. Uh, Can't wait for you to see what's in store this season. Today, we have a very special guest, Joseph Buddenberg. Joseph Buddenberg is an animal liberation activist, and he was imprisoned for some ALF actions that happened in 2013. We're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about his prison experience, uh, and we're going to talk about the above ground work that he continues today, what his uh, opinion is of the current animal rights movement, and much more. But before we get into the episode, I want to remind you that the Animal Liberation Hour is a project of animal activism mentorship. AAM is a free multinational program that helps aspiring animal rights activists, as well as those who are already activists but want to take their activism to the next level. From one-on-one mentorship to free workshops and trainings to this podcast, AAM seeks to empower humans to fight for animals so that the world will have more activists and we can achieve liberation sooner. For more information, visit AnimalActivismMentorship.com and follow AAM on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube at Animal Activism Mentorship. You can keep up with the Animal Liberation Hour on AAM's social media too. Animal Activism Mentorship is fueled by FARM, Farm Animal Rights Movement. I hope that you all enjoy listening to this conversation with Joseph as much as I enjoyed speaking with him. What an incredible activist, a hero for animals. Enjoy this episode. So welcome everybody to another episode of the Animal Liberation Hour. Today I have animal liberationist and animal rights activist Joseph Buddenberg. Uh, how's it going, man? Pretty well, pretty well. How about you? I'm good, man. I'm I'm excited that you're on today. Um, yeah, I just want to ask you, like, first of all, uh, I mean, well, you've you've had a, a long career in uh, activism. You've been in the movement for a long time now. Um, So I kind of want to start from the beginning, just like what led you to veganism and animal rights? Was was there a moment like when you were young that kind of, you know, piqued your interest or piqued your compassion or something and led you led you down that road? Or was there like one moment? What how did you start down this path? Um, I got involved, uh, I got exposed to like radical politics and animal liberation through like the hardcore punk scene. Uh, when I was a teenager, I was like really into like extreme metal music. And, um, I had some friends that were into like vegan straight edge hardcore. And so we would trade CDs and I'll never forget. My friend Shane gave me like a stack of CDs. It was like one King down. Uh, raid hands off the animals and earth crisis and i always preferred like heavy metal music and in the metal scene but uh what i liked about this this hardcore music that i was shown was that you know it wasn't just about being an outcast for outcast sake it was more about like making the world a better place and seemed to have like a real a real message around changing the world uh you know earth liberation, animal liberation were themes that were pretty present at that time. Yeah. So what was it about that music? Was it like the community or was it the, the lyrics of the songs? Like what kind of sparked your interest there? I think the, I think the lyrics just being so, um, so sort of extreme, like, you know, they talked about animal rights, but it wasn't necessarily like from a, from a perspective that would have turned me off. It was, it was like, it appealed to like, you know, us outcasts. Like it was, it was very, uh, it was very intense. It was very militant. They were talking about the animal liberation front. They were talking about economic sabotage, you know? And I I mean, it caught me very young. So I was like, I was just trying to learn everything I could about this scene and about this music. Um, 
So started like just looking on the internet, reading about the animal liberation front and learning about like different sorts of tactics and, uh, you know, more militant, more militant tactics. I felt like we're, we're very at the center of, of that scene at that time. So when you started listening to this kind of music and presumably like going to some of these shows and stuff, um, were you already like vegan or vegetarian or something, or was this all like brand new? I was not, it was all brand new to me. Like I had no idea what was happening to animals. Um, I sort of grew up, uh, you know, fishing, just eating meat, not really thinking about it. And so, you know, to be told through these lyrics that I was like part of a system of oppression and injustice, I think really made me think, you know, and as a kid, you're, you, you know, you're not as enculturated into those systems of violence. So it, uh, it really affected me in a deep way. How old were you during that time? Uh, I was like 16, 17 when I first got exposed to this stuff. Okay. Wow. And where was this? I grew up in Virginia, mm-hmm. Virginia Beach. Okay, cool. So, so uh, how did, was there like a progression? Did you, you know, like start getting into, you know, legal forms of activism and then did it evolve into like illegal direct action or did you know, like right away, like, you know, this is kind of what I want to do. Well, at the time I didn't know any other activists really. I mean, I, you know, other than kids in the hardcore scene who are not really activists, but uh, everything I was reading at that time pretty much focused and was centered on illegal activity and militant activity. So that's sort of the stuff that appealed to me that I felt was most effective. Um, you know, I felt like it was better to cause economic sabotage to animal abusers than just hold signs. So um, I started out doing underground activity before I'd ever gone to a protest or anything like that. Um, it was all mostly like small scale economic sabotage, petty vandalism mostly. So what, like around what year was this? This was like 2000, I went vegan in 2002. So this would have been like 2002, 2003. It just kind of jumped right in. Okay, cool. Yeah. So I I didn't come into the movement till way later. So, so I know, I know, you know, a lot of people that like came into the movement back in, you know, like the nineties and early two thousands, you know, there was, um, a lot more of a, uh, of an emphasis on this kind of activism um uh it seems like what is it was that the case yeah it was it was very common for people to get um exposed to to animal liberation through like vegan straight edge hardcore and and uh you know to learn about the animal liberation front like that was that was something that was always sort of front and center um like earth crisis has songs about the alf and um yeah that was that was big in that scene at that time. So you said, you said you started out kind of with some, uh, small scale stuff and, um, what kind of, uh, process took place to end up, you know, going in the direction you did, which was, you know, like mass liberations. It was a, it was a very long, slow process. So, um, you know, 2002, 2003, I was doing, you know, my first illegal activity for animals, which was, you know, maybe throwing bricks through windows or, you know, glass etching solution on windows, things like that, more small scale economic sabotage that I felt like, you know, wasn't, I always wanted to build up to large scale liberations, but the problem was that I always I always felt like there were too few people to work with. Um, I didn't know anyone who wanted to engage in that kind of activity. So I was sort of constrained to like just economic sabotage. Um, in 2006, I moved out to California and started working on like above ground campaigns. Um, at the time it was like the tail end of the shack campaign and we did some demos, um, I remember one in particular, we did a home demo outside a Wachovia board of directors home and uh, they immediately cut their ties with the laboratory. And I was like, wow, there's, there's something to this tactic. Um, 
you know, uh, above ground activity can be effective. Um, so we started working on a campaign against University of California vivisection, went pretty hard on that campaign. And also at the time we had a, an anti-fur campaign against a local fur store in Oakland that we were just going after really hard, like weekly demos. Um, and I was combining that with like underground activity against, against the targets. Um, that store ended up closing. We closed that store in like a year or two. Um, but we were, we were going really hard for a while. Can you take a moment to just kind of like briefly explain how some of those pressure campaigns were working? Um, I know, I know there's like kind of a lot to it in some instances, but for, for anybody who's listening, that's kind of like unfamiliar with pressure campaigns or unfamiliar in how, you know, the underground and the above ground kind of like work together but separately and don't know who each other are and you know this and that can you just sort of kind of go through all that a little bit sure so so i think the best use of a pressure campaign is to identify a um an industry that's already kind of vulnerable or has like public consciousness against it and um yeah you just you you know you go after them with a diversity of tactics um as hard as possible, you know, so, so demonstrations and protests at the offices, uh, the homes, um, and then usually, you know, historically, uh, these campaigns have involved like a lot of underground activity, you know, the first, the first really effective pressure campaigns came out of the United Kingdom and like involved like liberations and sabotage as well as like constant protests. Um, and at the time when I was, when I was working on pressure campaigns, there was a lot of like momentum against the university of California for like its primate vivisection program. So that's what we started working on. Um, and yeah, I was, we were doing constant home demos and, uh, just sabotage the vivisectors properties. I was at least, um, and it just seemed like there was a real momentum. And so we were, we would just continue to work really hard on that. Yeah. So what, what's like going through your head while you're, you know, um, you know, obviously you don't have to get into anything detailed that you don't want to, but what's going through your head, you know, like while planning a raid and then while actually executing that raid, because I, I think for so many, it just, uh, maybe seems un unfathomable or unreachable or something, but, uh, yeah. Like what's, what's kind of going through your mind. Yeah. I mean, that was like, um, like I said, a long process from, from like small scale illegal activity to above ground demos to like raiding fur farms. And, you know, a lot of it was like just psyching myself out. Like I felt like, you know, a lot of times you'll, you'll read about the ALF and you'll think these, they're like these, you know, super sophisticated, like skilled commandos or something. And it's like, that's not actually the case. I would show up to fur farms and they wouldn't even have a fence. Um, so it was actually like shocking when I would, when I, when I would pull these raids off and the, the ease, you know, that, that's what always stuck with me driving away from the farms is like, you know, I should have been doing this a lot sooner. <laughs> Wow. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, after, after my first sort of federal case getting indicted for, uh, for the protests and, you know, um, the pressure campaign against the university of California, I felt like I really wanted to do something that was going to have an effect. I mean, early on in my activism, I kind of like prepared for the possibility and the probability of prison. Um, and I just knew that I wanted to, you know, if I were going to go to prison, if, if prison was part of the equation, I wanted it to be for something tangible, something that actually had an effect in the lives of animals and not just, you know, sent a message or, you know, caused a little bit of damage. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm going to get more to uh, some, some prison stuff in a moment. Um, 
I, I want to ask you like when you're, and I've asked you this before, uh, in, in a different setting, but, uh, yeah, I just want to know what does it feel like to open those cages and just watch animals disappear into the night? Like what's that feeling like in general? And and then if you, if you have like any specific, um, moments that stand out that you'd like to share. Feels amazing. Um, yeah, like I said, I'd been, I'd been wanting to do that for years and, um, you know, it's, it's, it's sort of the culmination of everything we believe in as, as vegans or as activists, um, you know, to literally take an animal out of a cage and, and give him and her a new life is, is a beautiful thing. And, um, you, you know, the, you know, I'll always mark those memories, you know, those are, those are my greatest memories. Yeah. Is it, is there any, is there any, um, anything specific that stands out like one night in particular? Oh, I remember, um, I remember reading, uh, raiding this tiny farm in Minnesota and, um, you know, it was, it was right along a Creek. And so as soon as I open the cages, the animals come flying out and just swim away. Um, and there was this sort of profound feeling that like, you know, these animals are not going to get recaptured. This is going to be, you know, a new life for them. Um, I knew that the recapture rate was going to be very low and that, you know, I just saved hundreds of lives in a matter of minutes. It was an, it was an amazing feeling. Yeah. I can, I can only imagine what, what that must feel like. Um, so how, you know, how did you end up getting caught? Like how long was all this going on? And then, and then what happened when you got caught? So these fur farm raids occurred in 2013 from the summer to the fall. Um, you know, in like November um, is pelting season, November, early December. Uh, so every, every animal in every fur farm is, is killed for their pelts. Um, so we continued towards the end, towards right before the end of the, or right right before the beginning of the pelting season. And, uh, you know, I think, I think the count was 10 fur farms getting raided, 10 fur farms got raided in that season. Um, and I wasn't indicted until a couple of years later, uh, unbeknownst to me, there was a huge federal investigation. They spent millions of dollars. Um, yeah, they, they, they had searched my co-defendant's house and found, you know, some fur industry literature and, uh, pair of bolt cutters and things like that, you know, so it didn't take, it didn't take too many leaps for them to, uh, to indict us on a charge of conspiracy. I was never actually charged with any of the raids because I don't think the government could place me at any of those, at the scenes of any of those farms, but, uh, they did indict me on conspiracy. Yeah. Can you talk about that charge a little bit? I, I know a lot of uh, like ALF and ELF activists, you know, when, if you, if you do any research into their cases or just listen to their accounts, you know, you'll hear that word a lot, conspiracy. Um, can you talk about like what that is and how the, the state uses that to get these activists? Sure. So, so conspiracy is sort of a favorite charge for prosecutors. Um, they don't necessarily have to place you at the scene or have any kind of like hard evidence against you. They just have to uh, show that there's an agreement between two or more people to commit a crime. And, you know, when you have a charge like animal enterprise terrorism, that is so like vague and just sort of like a designer statute for these industries, you know, they can almost say that anything was, was part of a conspiracy or evidence of a conspiracy. Um, in my case, they used, you know, the fur industry literature, the tools and, uh, some, like some, some animal liberation literature that they had found. So for those that don't know, like how, how are they able to, uh, tag a nonviolent activist, uh, under a category like terrorist? How's that possible? Oh, I think it was a long process for the industry to 
to get from there to where we're at today, like I think they, there's a long concerted effort to, to label activists as terrorists. Um, I think in the eighties when the animal liberation front was raiding laboratories, you know, the industry was at a loss as to what to do because these were, you know, these were seen as like Robin hood style raids, like, you know, people were coming in and saving animals and sending the footage to the media. And, you know, it, it, the public was not against what the ALF was doing. Um, and so, you know, they were, they were really searching for sort of like boogeymen to, to, to use, to vilify the movement. And, um, you know, some of the more extreme tactics, I think they were able to use those better. It wasn't as, it wasn't as supportable by the public. So, um, you know, they, they were lobbying Congress for years and before it was the AETA, it was the AEPA, which was like, uh, I think first passed in 1992 and made it a federal crime to, to interfere with an animal enterprise. And then when they amended it, it just became more broad and the punishments more severe in 2006. And where I was indicted under the ATA four, the, the ATA four case, um, was the first arrest under the animal enterprise terrorism act. So we were sort of like the test case to see how far the law could go. Um, we ended up getting that case dismissed. Uh, it got thrown out just for like vagueness and, you know, the judge said, you can't do this. You can't just charge someone with a, with a crime that, you know, when you're not alleging anything criminal, uh, cause in that case, it was just home demos and chalking sidewalks. That's what they were trying to say was terrorism. Wow. <laughs> you know, uh, 9-11 happened when I was in seventh grade and I remember sitting in, uh, my science class and I get, I'm guessing it had already happened. At least the first tower had already happened. And, you know, they were showing the replay on, on the news and, you know, our classroom kind of paused what we were doing and we watched this thing that was happening. Um, and I don't even know, I don't even know if that first time I saw it, if, if I knew that they were, you know, terrorists or whatever, um, you know, or if it was an accident or, you know, what, um, I just remember seeing it on TV and then, you know, later hearing that it was, you know, terrorists and, uh, all this stuff. But, um, you know, remembering the kind of effect that word had on me when I was in, you know, middle school and, you know, in my mind then, you know, thinking of terrorists as people who, kill other people, uh, you know, um, just later on getting into animal rights and hearing that same word used to describe, you know, a not a nonviolent activist. It just blows my mind. I, I'm just wondering like what it's like for you being labeled as that being labeled, um, by the state as a terrorist. What, what's that like? Uh, it's surreal and Kafkaesque, and it constantly comes up in my life where I'll be detained. Um, actually, just got arrested last weekend, and like the arresting officer had to uh, call the FBI, and he was on the phone with the FBI or Department of Justice for like an hour or two, trying to figure out what to do with me. And um, so it's yeah, it's surreal. It's you know, it's it's crazy. I I once had a cop detain me with his gun drawn because he saw the terrorist warning that comes up when he runs my license plate. And, uh, you know, when he got to talking to me, you know, he's like, what is this terrorism thing? I was like, oh, I was convicted of animal rights activism essentially. And his demeanor just completely shifted, like from being super aggressive to just being completely calm, like just like that. And, um, you know, so it's, it's a weird thing, man. It's, it's, it's definitely weird to be, to be called a terrorist for, for advocating for animals and for saving lives. I still can't, I still have a hard time wrapping my head around it today. Yeah, that is hard to, uh, I can, I mean, I can only imagine, uh, having that tag, um, you know, obviously fur farmers are terrorizing these animals. I mean, what these animals go through, can you just talk about what, what animals go through on, on fur farms? So animals on fur farms are, confined to tiny wire cages their entire lives um, they can't even turn around these are genetically wild um, native wildlife 
Um, and you know, they're, they're just living in a cage awaiting a death by means of gassing or anal electrocution. And I mean, I, I recorded some undercover footage at a fur farm last year and it, you know, the industry has not changed at all. It's, it's just as disgusting and atrocious as it always has been. Um, yeah, animals just confined to, to tiny wire cages and, you know, they, they, they're just trapped. They're everything wild to them. Everything natural to them is just taken from them. Yeah. And other than, other than the law, which, you know, would punish someone for, for doing this, who wouldn't, who wouldn't want to open the cages if they came across something like that, uh, animals in this situation, that does not seem like an act of terrorism. It obviously seems like an act of bravery and compassion and common sense, even just, (laughs) you know, like animals, they, they're the ones being terrorized. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so yeah, can you, can you tell me, uh, what it was like once you got caught and what ended up happening? How, how, you know, how long were you, uh, how long of a sentence did you have? How much time did you serve? And, uh, what, what was your prison experience like? So, as I said, the fur farm raids occurred in 2013. I wasn't arrested until the summer of 2015. Um, so it was like a long federal investigation. I was arrested by like 10 FBI agents, um, released on house arrest, uh, facing 10 years in prison. Um, spent like six or seven months, you know, waiting through the court system. Uh, Ultimately, me and my co-defendant decided that it was best for us to take a non-cooperating plea deal um, and plead guilty to the charges. And I ended up getting sentenced to 24 months and she got sentenced to 21 months and uh, served, served my time, served my time at prisons all over uh, the United States, really. They, they, they shipped me around a lot. Um, I'm sure, I'm sure the question that many, uh, many want to know that are listening to this is, uh, you know, what was the situation like being, being vegan in prison? Um, not only just food wise, but, uh, you know, like what did other people think of you for, for, uh, being vegan and, you know, being an animal rights activist, what did other, um, prisoners think inmates? Oh, they mostly thought I was insane. They mostly thought I was crazy. (laughs) Um, as far as the vegan food, it was, it was very difficult. Um, there are like a few staple vegan items on commissary, like oatmeal, peanut butter, um, tortillas and beans, things like that. Um, so you pretty much have to subsist off of the commissary, which they charge you to buy from. Uh, so some outside support is necessary. But fortunately, we had political case, so there was a lot of outside support. Um, in the dining hall, there is a meatless meal at lunch and dinner, but it's often not vegan. It's just vegetarian, so you can't really eat that. Uh, they had, like, the most disgusting veggie burger I'd ever seen that was, like, served oh. pretty often. Oh. And so whenever I went to the dining hall and that was on my plate, I'd always get made fun of by the other prisoners. So. <laughs> <laughs> it definitely, definitely made you know made me a laughing stock in some ways. Being staying vegan in prison. Yeah, I mean, was it like a laughing stock? Like it was kind of funny, or was it was it like a serious thing? Uh I mean, they were just teasing me. They were just making fun of me. Yeah, they didn't they didn't have any serious beef with me or anything. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, I hear I hear different things from different people who have been. In, prison for stuff like this you know some people say that the other inmates are you know like really respect the heck out of them for you know like doing something they believe in and others you know have have issues with with people did you ever did you ever like fear for your safety in prison or was it mostly okay in that regard um 
mostly okay. Everyone's pretty respectful. When you first enter prison, you have to show your paperwork. So you gotta you gotta prove to them that you're not like a snitch or a sex offender. Those are the two things they're really concerned about. Um, and once you once you show them that, they pretty much leave you alone and they respect you. Um, there were a couple sticky situations where you know it felt like I didn't necessarily know all the convict rules and maybe I'd have to fight, but ended up avoiding that and ended up being fine. Did the uh, did the terrorism label uh, affect you at all in in prison? Did anybody have any questions about that? Maybe you know maybe suspicious of you because of that? The staff, the staff mostly uh, had a problem. They would like hold my mail. They would, uh, you know, they would mess with me. They would find certain ways to mess with me that they wouldn't do to a normal prisoner. Um, so like they'd have to scan all my incoming and outgoing mail because of some department of justice regulation. Um, and during transfer, they would throw me in solitary confinement. And then I would ask them, like, why, why am I in solitary? And they would say, oh, you're a terrorist, you know? <laughs> and you're sort of going in circles with them, like, hey, can I talk to the captain? Can I talk to the warden about this? Like, I'm not actually a terrorist. It's just my charge on paper. And, you know, you pretty much get nowhere. So it sort of follows you throughout your prison sentence. It's a, it's a pretty heavy thing. How long would they keep you in solitary confinement for? Um... When I got transferred at Oklahoma City Federal Transfer Center, I was there for like two weeks. Um, oh my gosh. No books, no mail, just sitting in a cell. Um, yeah. And then, yeah, I had, I had some longer stints in solitary um, because of like issues I had with, with some of the other prisoners. How did you, how did you get through that? Like, what do you, if you have no books or no mail or anything, like, how do you, I mean, it, it must just seem like a, a, a time warp or something. Like you don't know how much time's passed. Like you don't really know how long you've been in there, I guess, maybe. Um, how, do you, how do you mentally just push through and survive? That time in Oklahoma City was the toughest time because, like I said, no, no books, no mail, no sort of connection to the outside world. But uh, the longer stints I did in solitary were uh, – I was able to receive books from the outside and was able to receive mail. And, you know, so that, that made the time a little easier. I uh, had a cellmate. So um, the federal system they've outlawed, like it, it's still called solitary confinement because you're locked down and you can't leave your cell, but they've outlawed single cell solitary confinement because of like, you know, some, some scandals and some lawsuits. Um, yeah, it's difficult. I mean, yeah, when, when you can receive books, you just, you devour them, you, you read as much as you can, you work out, you, you find ways to, to manage and to get through it. So would you say that, uh, all that you went through with, with the prison system and, uh, going through sol solitary confinement, going through, um, you know, what you still go through to this day, which is having a terrorism label uh, on your record. Would you say that it's all worth it for what you accomplished? Yeah, it was absolutely worth it. But, you know, not to say that I wouldn't go back and change things if I could. I mean, it's good. It's important to keep in mind that like most people who, who utilize ALF tactics and, you know, do not get caught. Um, you know, I, I made some mistakes and I got caught. And so, you know, it, but it was worth it. I mean, I saved thousands of lives and yeah, I just, I felt like that was, you know, that was the only thing that I could have done under those circumstances. You know, I uh, investigated fur farms and I found animals in complete suffering. And so I, I couldn't have done nothing. Yeah. Can you, yeah, you, you talked a, a second ago about, you know, just like devouring these books and letters when you would get them. Can you, um, can you talk about the importance of um, support for political prisoners? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, um, you know, those times when I would receive letters, uh, 
you know, reading and writing letters were really my escape from prison. Um, I would get like beautiful postcards, you know, people would tell me about their, you know, the hike they went on or their road trip they went on and, you know, you could just envision freedom and you weren't, you know, you were kind of outside of your barren cell for at least that time that you're reading that letter. Um, yeah. And then just books are essential. I mean, you, the, the time in there is it, it, it passes in a, in a much different way. And, um, just any kind of stimulation and activity is necessary for prisoners. And we, we need to be doing more of that for our prisoners. How was it for you? Did you, did you have like one particular person on the outside who was advocating for you or, or did you have a, a team or, or were there, um, did people just find out and kind of naturally uh, support you or how, how did all that kind of work for you while you're on the inside? Uh, I had a movement lawyer and a support team that were kind of advocating for me with a website and social media presence. And, but, you know, a lot of people would just find out about my case through the website or social media and start writing to me. And those were some of my favorite like letters. And those were some of my best relationships that I formed. Um, and then like, as soon as the book list would go up on the website, uh, you know, I'd be, I'd get the books within a day or two. So, you know, the support was, the support was amazing you know, it was, uh, I can't even, I can't even speak to that. Like that was, that was just above and beyond. Yeah. I mean, if you're having to go through, you know, the trials and tribulations of prison, I would imagine, you know, support from the outside mean, means everything, right? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I have, you know, I received thousands of letters the time I was in and, you know, it was just, it was too much mail to even respond to. It was, uh, the support was amazing. The support was incredible. Um, and that's something that every, every sort of movement prisoner deserves. Um, yeah, there's, uh, if people do want to write to a prisoner, there's Marius Mason. He's got a few years left, uh, on his sentence. And then, uh, Joseph Dickey just pled guilty and he'll be sentenced, uh, I believe this summer he'll start serving a sentence probably later this summer, July or August. Yeah. We'll, we'll put that in the, in the show notes for sure. Um, so if people want to support, they they'll know how to find that information. Um, I think one of the last times I checked on Marius, I think he's only allowed to, uh, get letters from so many people, but he can kind of take them, off and on the list as he wants to or something. So you might have to, I don't know if that's still the case. People might have to investigate that a little bit, but I know there's other ways to support as well on his website. And we'll, we'll link that below Do you. Uh, well, talk, talk a little bit about the, um, the anti fur movement now, because some time has passed since you first got into, um, you know, activism and then into um, the anti-fur movement and, you know, participating in these liberations. Um, a lot of times passed, um, and I'm sure the movement looks much different now than it did back then. I'd love to hear about some of the differences and also, um, you know, what you think about um, the state of the anti-fur movement right now and, and how you've been able to uh, participate above ground. Oh, it's been incredible. It's, it's, you know, we've achieved victories that I didn't even think were possible. Um, a lot of the CAF USA campaigns have been just so successful in such a short period of time. Um, we've worked on all of those. I live in Texas now and we've worked on all of those campaigns and, um, you know, every time there's a campaign like Neiman Marcus, I remember thinking like, okay, this will probably take a year or two and they folded it in, in like two months. <laughs> so, you know, it's, it's, it's sort of an unprecedented time. And I think that, I think that activists should really, should really look at the fur industry right now is, you know, and get involved because uh, this is a really vulnerable industry and we are having a huge effect right now just through like above ground tactics. So this is, this is big what what's it been like for you um 
being in the underground and then being in prison and then now being on the outside and, and shifting your uh, activism to uh, above ground stuff. What, what's, what's that whole kind of transition been like for you? Oh man, it's, it's been great to finally win through just strictly above ground tactics. Like that was something that wasn't possible years ago. Um, we'd, we'd have to go really hard and probably still not win. But I think right now there's just a confluence of forces against the fur industry, you know, like COVID-19 public consciousness and like, you know, just economic trouble that they're in. And so, you know, as activists, we want to do what's most effective. We don't want to just, you know, do what's most militant or what's illegal for its own sake. Like, you know, so I've, I've been really impressed with the, with, with working on these campaigns and how, how effective they've been. It's, it's felt amazing, honestly. Yeah. I know, uh, last year there were, um, there were all the calf victories and then there were victories outside of calf that like, you know, may or may not have sort of been related, you know, kind of like uh, Canada Goose went down around the same time as Neiman Marcus. You know, some people think, well, you know, Canada Goose sold some of their stuff inside Neiman Marcus. So maybe they knew Neiman Marcus was about to go for free. So maybe they saw the writing on the wall, you know, there's that kind of stuff. But yeah, I mean, sure. last year it was help, help, help me on the ones I miss. I know it was uh, Alice and Olivia and then Saks Fifth Avenue and Neiman Marcus, um, uh, Oscar de la Renta, St. Laurent, uh, and then Canada Goose. Um, Dolce & Gabbana. Dolce & Gabbana, yeah. Yeah, and there's some more that I'm missing too. I know there's like some Canadian brands uh, that went for free. Yeah. Monique Lulier was one. Mm -hmm. um, man, there's been a ton. There's been too many to keep up with, yeah. Yeah, it's like, it's hard to even keep up with. Uh, you know, I thought we'd still be on Saks Fifth Avenue right now, but it's <laughs> it's gone so quickly. It's unbelievable. Um, and can you t can you talk a little bit about the, um, the current campaign against LVMH, uh, which is Louis Vuitton Moet Hennessy, who, uh, you know, is the uh, conglomerate that owns... Dior and Louis Vuitton and Marc Jacobs and, um, you know, a lot of these other companies. Can you just talk about that campaign right now? I know it's probably like the biggest challenge yet. Um, I'd love to hear how you've been involved in this campaign so far and kind of what it's looking like out there. Yeah. So we've been doing, um, disruptions at Louis Vuitton, uh, out here in Austin and, um, they're right across the street from Tiffany. So like we go and disrupt Tiffany, then we go over to Louis Vuitton and disrupt them. Um, and the great thing about LVMH, I think is that the, the, the targets are everywhere. Like, you know, they own so many fashion brands, they own so many um, stores that it's just, you know, there's a target in every city. There's multiple targets in most cities. So that's been great. Um, Last disruption we did at Louis Vuitton, there was a huge police presence and a couple of us ended up getting arrested. So I don't know how that will turn out. I'll have to I'll have to fight that case for a few months, but uh, currently facing like just a disorderly conduct charge. The police were like scrambling around trying to figure out what to charge us with. And that's all they got was a noise violation. So. Yeah, and I'm, I'm going to ask you how people can support your work uh, and all that a little later. And, and we'll be sure to link that in the show notes also. Um, can you, can you talk about, uh, you know, like why I protest Tiffany and co when, when they don't sell fur, like what's the point of um, protesting a company like that, even though they don't sell fur, how does that help the movement for people who are wondering? Right. So LVMH is doing this all for money. It's all about their bottom line. So whatever creative ways we can do to affect their bottom line and to sort of, uh, you know, hit them in the pocketbook is going to be effective. Um, it's going to be, you know, it's going to be a closer victory. Like um, they own Birkenstock, they own Tiffany & Co, Fendi, Dior, like there's limitless targets for people to go and disrupt and protest. And, you know, the more 
the more you can affect their bottom line, the quicker the victory will come. So basically, even even the companies that LVMH owns that are not selling fur, it's it's basically still beneficial to protest them because they're still under like the LVMH umbrella, I guess. Totally, totally. And it affects their profit motive and it affects their ability to do business, you know, until they enact that fur free policy. That's all. It's a pretty simple demand. And until they do that, they should expect their businesses to get disrupted and protested constantly. Yeah. And even though LVMH is like by far the biggest, you know, target yet, as far as getting a company to go for free. um, Yeah. I mean, I guess, I guess activists can use that to their advantage because they own so many uh, stores, just like you said, you know, like most people can find an LVMH, some kind of LVMH location near them. There's, there's so many stores and they're just, they're just never going to know, where activists are going to come from next, which store there's so there's so many, it's, it's probably impossible for them to, you know, put up a huge line of defense at every single LVMH location. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And I mean, that's going to be, that's going to be costly for them as well. If they got to, you know, hire security at every store and, you know, sort of be on, be on the lookout for activists. Yeah, definitely. So with all this, uh, with all these victories that are happening, um, you know, in the in the anti-fur movement, everything we just talked about, all these companies going for free um, last year. Do you think there's still a place for illegal actions as far as the fur industry goes, or do you think that the above ground movement is on a trajectory that will, you know, hopefully end this soon. What is that? What is that looking like for you? I think there's always a place for underground direct action. Um, specific to the target. I mean, maybe not with LVMH, maybe not with the, you know, CAF USA campaigns, maybe not, but, you know, animals are in a dire stark situation. And so, direct action can save their lives immediately. And so, you know, at the point of production at fur farms, absolutely, you know, direct action is needed and, and, and really vital. Um, you know, maybe not at the retail level because we've been winning these campaigns so quickly that, you know, exposing yourself to that kind of repression probably isn't necessary. Um, but we'll see. I mean, we'll see how the campaigns go and we'll see how LBMH goes, but Ultimately, uh, direct action is still needed um, to liberate animals from places of abuse, from fur farms and anywhere else they're held captive. So, so basically, you're saying like it's always, you know, an, an animal could always be liberated and it would change their lives forever. But you know, maybe it's not worth the um, resources it would take if somebody got caught for some, you know, like economic sabotage or something like that to a target right now since since uh things are going so well is that is that sort of what you mean yeah totally totally i think you know when i first started doing direct action there was just kind of a focus on militancy and and you know i wasn't necessarily thinking that strategic and you know my thinking on on that has evolved over the years and you know it's important if you're doing underground action to to really be strategic, you know, to say, you know, this, this action is something that's going to be necessary and is going to be life-saving and not just, you know, send a message or, or, you know, lead to a lot of repression. Um, so I think at the, at the retail level, it's not needed yet, but, uh, yeah, I think, I think that animals always deserve to be liberated and need to be liberated. Yeah. Um, so we talked a little bit about, uh, prisoner support, political prisoner support um, earlier. <clears throat> Can you talk a little bit about how that might extend into uh, after a prisoner is on the outside? Because I know I know a lot of times for political prisoners, you know, like the, the support kind of drops off once they're out. But, you know, when when they do get out, there's still a lot of, uh, you know, obstacles, especially if you're labeled as a terrorist or 
you know, something like that. Can you talk a little bit about um, the importance of that and maybe like any support that was provided for you that was really beneficial so that, you know, people might know how they can support others that are transitioning and, and uh, yeah. And also obviously like you're continuing to do activism and, and need support in that way as, as well. But yeah, I would just love to hear your take on all that. Yeah. I think that, you know, when, when a prisoner is released, you know, they face a lot of hurdles, um, you know, with a felony record, it can be, it can be tough to find housing and jobs and, um, you know, so, so it's unique and individual to the prisoner, but I think just helping them sort of reintegrate into society and also like, you know, welcoming back into the movement, um, can be financial support that's needed to, to, you know, get back on their feet after spending however long they spent in a cell. Um, you know, it can be unique to the, to the prisoner. Sometimes, sometimes prisoners would need help getting like therapy or things like that. Um, yeah. And then I, I feel like continuing to do the work that I'm doing, like, you know, maybe makes me more of a target for the state, you know, as, as someone who has a felony history and is a convicted terrorist. So, you know, just continuing to support them if, if they do get arrested again is, is, is necessary and vital. Yeah. I, I know. Um, I know you said you were just arrested like pretty recently um, at a, at a nonviolent protest against uh, LVMH. Um, yeah. I mean, like it, for, for, for folks like you who have that kind of record, like, is it is it riskier to do activism i mean just even if it's above ground like you know like what what how are you kind of navigating that whole world uh, i can be i mean i think in the event of like sentencing or you know if I, if i were convicted on anything they would go harder with sentencing um yeah i just try to just try to keep the actions completely you know safe and and, and legal. Um, yeah, I'm currently facing two charges. So I got a, I got a criminal trespass charge from YSL back in September of last year. Um, got arrested at a protest right before they went for free. Uh, so I don't know what's going on with that charge. I still don't have a court date. The court system's moving pretty slow. Uh, there's a chance I might get dropped or there's a chance I might have to, you know, pay a fine or, do a little time in jail. And then, yeah, like you said, last week I was arrested at LVMH. Um, there were a bunch of cops on the scene. Um, and there was like a plainclothes detective and they were sort of running around um, trying to figure out what to charge us with. And in the end, uh, one of us got charged with criminal mischief and all they could figure out to charge me with was uh, disorderly conduct by noise, which is like, classy misdemeanor kind of carries a fine uh worst case scenario but um it definitely seemed like the police wanted something more you know there was seven or eight cops at the scene and a plainclothes detective so it was you know it was it was scary for a second it was like uh, i don't know what the, what the cops are going to try to do here yeah yeah i can imagine that's kind of stressful um to say the least um <clears throat> so how can uh, how can people support your activism that you're doing right now? I have a Patreon page, um, patreon.com slash Joseph Buddenberg. Um, sort of just um, that, that, that helps me continue the activism. On, on the Patreon, I post like, you know, some of my favorite underground actions and some of my favorite um, writings and stories from animal liberation history. Um, so that, that, that really helps me continue what I'm doing. Um, there's a cut, there's a fundraiser on Facebook right now for my legal fees, but I should be good on that. I just, I just looked at that. That seemed to be, seems like I'll be covered on, on the legal costs for now. Yeah. I haven't asked you yet about your work and kind of like preserving some, uh, animal liberation history. Can you, can you talk a little bit about that? Like the importance of, preserving that history and kind of what you've been doing in that regard. 
Totally. It's, you know, it's such a forgotten history. Like a lot of people don't have a sense of, you know, what this movement has been and, you know, what we've, what we, what kind of, what kind of repression we've experienced and also what kind of victories we've achieved. Um, you know, a lot of those, a lot of those zines and a lot of those publications were lost through like FBI raids and just, you know, things like that. Um, so sort of like trying to preserve that history, I think is essential, you know, to, to an effective movement. Um, if we want to, if we want to move forward, we have to know what we've already done in the past and, you know, what's been effective and what's been ineffective. A lot of tactics that people are trying today have already been tried before. Um, so, you know, I think it's essential to, to learn the history of the movement and to, to figure out, you know, where you can place your, your strengths. Yeah. Um, I just finished reading Feral Summer, which is a, a leaflet that talks about the ALF's 2013 war against the fur industry, which is, you know, the time that uh, you were doing some liberations. And uh, yeah, it talks, talks a little bit about your history uh, and some of the actions that you took part in and it talks about some other ALF activists as well. Um, where can people get their hands on this? Um, they can get in touch with me through Patreon or through Instagram. Um, my Instagram handle is Joseph Buddenberg. Um, so yeah, there's plenty of ways for them to get in touch with me and I can send you a copy. Um, yeah, it's important to keep in mind that like hundreds upon hundreds of thousands of animals have been liberated by the animal liberation front. Like, this is often the animal's only hope and it's like the most effective route um, for activists to take. And so preserving that history is, is, you know, huge for me. Yeah. Yeah. I think I speak on behalf of a lot of, a lot of people when, you know, I say we appreciate that you're doing that. Um, all right. So if you were in a room full of brand new animal rights activists right now, um, and you were able to give them some important advice, uh, what would that advice be? Um, just leverage your strengths, look at what you're good at and try to, try to, try to be as effective as possible. Um, don't waste time. Don't do what feels good. Um, you know, try to figure out what's most effective and what's most strategic and move towards that. Um, I think a lot of times in, in activism, we do what feels good. Um, and this is true of like the underground and above ground. We do just what feels like cathartic and you know, what, what, what's going to make us feel better. Um, and I don't think that's the way we should be looking at it. We should be looking at what's most effective and what's most strategic. Um, exercise good security culture and yeah, read about the history of the movement. Yeah, and by the time this airs, you'll have done a uh, security culture workshop through Animal Activism Mentorship, and we'll link that below as well. That'll be on the Animal Activism Mentorship YouTube. Um, can't wait for that. Um, man, I appreciate you so much for taking the time to come on here and uh, chat. I've got so much respect for everything that you've done and continue to do. And, um, you know, not, not only are you doing all this activism, not only have you saved, you know, thousands of lives and all that, but, you know, I've seen you support other people who need help and everything like that. Um, it's, it's, it's an honor to know you and have done activism with you and to get to talk with you today. And I can't wait for people to hear this, man. I appreciate everything you do. Appreciate you, Troy. Yeah, thanks for having me. Thank you all so much for listening. Joseph's such an amazing guy. Uh, I'm lucky enough to have been able to do a little bit of activism with him, and he's just an amazing dude who, you know, risked his freedom and, um, you know, paid the price for his compassion. Um, He's just a courageous, brave, heroic activist. I hope that you will check out our show notes and 
support his above ground work through his Patreon. Uh, that keeps him going. We hope that you'll also rate and review the podcast. It helps others find it more easily. And the more people that find it, the more people can be inspired by the guests interviewed on our show, like the amazing Joseph Buddenberg. And hopefully we can turn that into actionable change for the animals. If you enjoy the Animal Liberation Hour and would like to support our work at Animal Activism Mentorship, please consider joining our Patreon for as little as $2 a month if you're able to do so. This goes such a long way in helping us grow the animal rights movement through mentorship. Don't forget to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube at Animal Activism Mentorship, where you can keep up with the podcast as well as everything AAM. One more reminder that you can sign up for a free mentor to help you with your activism at animalactivismmentorship.com. If you need a sign that you should be an activist for the animals, this is it. I also want to remind you about some of our upcoming uh, in-person events that Animal Activism Mentorship is hosting. On July 29th through August 7th, we will be having the AAM Chicago Convergence 2022. That's 10 days of action against the fur industry, and we're going to be taking action uh, against animal agriculture as well. And then also coming up, we have the Ohio Occurrence in Cleveland, and that'll be outreach, demos, protests, and other uh, actions. That's Friday, September 2nd through Sunday, September 4th. So three days of action for the animals. In the description, I'll include Animal Activism Mentorship's link tree, which has the links to the event pages and fundraisers and um, registration forms for these events. Uh, You do have to register to come to these events. So please check it out. We would love to see you in Chicago and in Cleveland. Uh, These events are great opportunities for activists to come together for the animals, especially if you're a new activist and you would like some guidance and you'd like the chance to be able to do some activism uh, under the wing of an expert activist. You can have the opportunity to do that. So the Chicago Convergence and the Ohio Occurrence, I'll put the link to the link tree in the description. So check that out. Also, remember, you can check out our workshops. You can check out our other podcast episodes. We've got so much going on. You can find it all in our link tree uh, and at animalactivismmentorship.com. Remember that it will take all of us to achieve animal liberation. Stay focused, stay positive, be effective, and keep doing your part. Until next time.